Water levels have a reputation for being a little inconsistent, but one thing they almost always do well is their music. Diving into the deep blue has birthed some of the greatest soundscapes in games, and some of the most diverse as well. Water can create such a vast range of experiences and emotions, from a joyful paddle at the beach to the terrors lurking in the deep. Water can be refreshing, or you can drown in it. It can represent adventure or a dead end. It can be tranquil and calming or angry and frightening. And it can be everything in between. This allows composers to draw from many different wells of inspiration and instill their music with a wide variety of emotion. As a result, some of the best and most influential game tracks have come from Under the Sea. Each little slug here caught in a rug here under the sea. That one's debatable. In this episode of GameScore Fanfare, I'm going to take a look at how underwater music has evolved over the years, and consistently changed our perceptions of what game music can be. Let's dive in. I'll try and keep the water puns to a minimum, but no promises. It's hard to start anywhere else but the original water level from Super Mario Bros. The underwater theme was the first piece of music Koji Kondo composed for Super Mario Bros. And so it represents the birth of what was to become a turning point for games and their music. Koji Kondo's inspiration for the soundtrack came when seeing the little plumber in action. His fast, jumpy movement called for music that was exciting and energetic. But when Mario goes for a swim, he's no longer fast and agile, but slow and floaty. And the music matches. The pace is slower, notes are held for much longer, and they flow into one another much more smoothly. But the biggest change was the time signature, moving from 4-4, the most common time signature, to 3-4, which is most often associated with the waltz. It's not hard to see the inspiration here when you compare the waltz to how Mario moves when he swims, with his bouncy upward thrust and slow gliding descent. This was more than likely the first ever video game piece not in common time, and it was really the first time game music was considered outside of itself. The underwater theme wasn't just background bleeps and bloops in a computer game. It was a waltz. Koji Kondo had placed an original piece of music from a game into the greater historical context of music, and never before had it been thought about in that way, at least not on such a wide scale. The main overworld theme might have more pop culture reach, but I'd argue that the underwater theme did much more for legitimizing game music. Super Mario Bros. also established a number of tropes associated with water levels and their music. Sluggish controls became the go-to underwater mechanic, so there was lots of slow-paced, smooth music going around. The waltz style was mostly left to Mario, but there was one aspect of it that caught on. Koji Kondo slightly altered the traditional waltz rhythm by moving the third note up to create this rising note pattern, which resembles an arpeggio, when notes in a chord are played in an ascending or descending order. Arpeggios are used all the time in underwater music. An ascending arpeggio can bring to mind bubbles rising to the surface, Combine it with a descending arpeggio and you get this wave-like pattern that feels like you're floating in the ocean. And even just downward motion. Ocarina of Time's Water Temple has a series of descending arpeggios, which makes sense when you consider that dungeon involves equipping the heavy iron boots and sinking to the bottom like an anchor. Koji Kondo's influence was everywhere, and it took someone who was a little bit removed to shake things up. <music> D 
David Wise's inspiration for his soundtrack to Donkey Kong Country came not from other games, but the synthetic film scores and pop music of the 80s. Rather than scoring character movement in aquatic ambience, David Wise immersed the player in the marine environment of Coral Capers, and this changed everything about the composition. Instead of a waltz rhythm, aquatic ambience disorients you by barely having a beat at all, giving you nothing tangible to grab hold of in the song, no solid ground to stand on. It used modern production techniques, such as applying filters to dampen the sound of the instruments, and a delay to highlight the great expanse of the ocean. And the instrumentation is sparse. There's a beautiful melody line, but it kind of blends in with the layer of synthy pads underneath it. This was unusual for the time. Game music almost always put melody in the spotlight. But in aquatic ambience, it's almost like David Wise tried to hide the melody. The trend for game and film score in the 21st century has been less melodic, more ambient. Music that doesn't draw attention to itself, but aims to immerse you in the world with as little distraction as possible. Donkey Kong Country, and in particular aquatic ambience, preceded this in games by at least a decade, acting as a paradigm for the new wave of game music. And in my opinion, it does it better than most because it still has that catchy melody. Aquatic Ambience even charmed the man himself, Koji Kondo, who strayed from the waltz style in Mario's next underwater outing. Diodiodox is sparse, it uses those familiar reverb-drenched synths, and it also doesn't have any percussion, at least while you're swimming. When you reach solid ground in this cavern though, drums are layered in on top to bring stability to the piece. This was the start of another method for scoring underwater, the dynamic approach. A famous example is Banjo-Kazooie, in which every level has its own underwater arrangement that seamlessly fades in whenever you duck dive under the surface. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see too much of this before the transition to CD quality audio made it much more difficult to do. But the technology is catching up and we're seeing it more and more. Even the new Donkey Kong Country game did it, so we've come full circle again. Water areas certainly aren't the only times when dynamic music is used, but they've definitely encouraged creative use of music in games. Looking back at the evolution of underwater music allows us to see the often overlooked impact it's had. From first legitimizing video game music and placing it within the context of music history, to paving the way for more experimental and ambient pieces, and encouraging unique and creative uses of dynamic music that can only ever be found in games. Water has consistently pushed the boundaries of game music, and the best part is, we get to reap the benefits of it with some of the greatest music ever written for games. Hey, thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making this video possible. I asked them for some suggestions of underwater music I could use in this video, and they certainly delivered. Special thanks goes out to my top level supporters. Chris Chapman, Mike TK, Nanalu, David Sternberg, Gregor Wolf, and Yedrick Walinski. I am incredibly grateful.